Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of our talk on misdiagnosis in body CT. We ended last time with this quote by Johnny Ivey saying that we need to come up with solutions, but we need to make people not so much really aware of the solution. If your solution is read more carefully, spend more time, do this, do that, probably not going to work. We need solutions so that you're not really aware of the problem and the solution. We need to make things simpler. One thing we found is that although there are like a million errors that anybody can make, and this article is more than a decade old, there are certain errors that are commonly made. And I think the best way of not making those errors is to see the errors. The reason we have case conference every Wednesday is to show interesting cases of great diagnoses and misdiagnoses. So when you see something, you recognize it. Brooke Jeffrey used to speak about his trauma checklist, and you ask him what's on his checklist, he would say, there are 10 things. And I would ask, how did you get those 10 things? He said, these are 10 things I've missed that I don't plan on missing again. So when you think about that, and you know the errors, and you know the sources of errors, you potentially will do better in avoiding them in the future. So let's look at some examples. Generically, if you ask me why do people miss things on CT, there are a lot of reasons. One is poor search strategy. You're doing an abdominal CT and you're not worrying about a PE, or you're doing a chest CT and you're not looking at the lower scans which go through the abdomen. Sometimes it's just a poor understanding of pathology. When you're looking at bowel and it's not well distended, is that abnormal? Or is it just not well distended? Is the stomach normal, but there's no water in the stomach or positive contrast? Or is it thickened folds? Well, if you say can't rule out gastric pathology or you say gastritis, you know, there are all sorts of things that happen. Just saying I don't know is not an answer either. The way you avoid having a lack of understanding of gastric pathology is to speak with your technologists and work with them so that every person, Every single person gets oral contrast, even if it's water. You have the stomach nicely distended, and you can pick up early gastric pathology, but you're not overcalling pathology. Also, when you're doing a study for a different reason, rule out dissection. You see a dissection, but you're not paying that careful attention to the kidney, and you miss a two-sonometer renal cell carcinoma. Maybe you just missed it entirely, or maybe it was a well-defined papillary, which wasn't very vascular. And since you were worried about the dissection and defining the vessel and its involvement, you just missed the lesion. Sometimes it's just you find one diagnosis, that satisfaction of search, and you miss the other three diagnoses. We know that unsuspected pathology, the so-called incidental finding perhaps, is on every study. What do you overcall? What do you undercall? What do you need to report? We know that incidental findings occur in every organ system. And again, some may be as simple as an incidental adenoma of no importance or a liver cyst or hepatic hemangioma or a splenic cyst. But others could be hepatoma, metastasis, an abscess, renal cell carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, primary ACC, and on and on and on. And then I have the last thing, which is checking residents and fellows. I mentioned this in my first talk today when I spoke about that, but it is true. We have great residents, we have great fellows, and you go over the cases with them. That's called teaching. But you don't look at the cases always the same way you would if you were reading by yourself. And you pay more attention to what the resident or fellow says than what you would be thinking from scratch. And that's a potential source of error as well. Other reasons, poor scan protocols. I mentioned the stomach not being distended. Same problem with small bowel. You need oral contrast. Ivy contrast. People, again, with the contrast shortage I mentioned, or just the ER doc saying, oh, who needs contrast? You just, just scan the patient. You don't need oral. You don't need IV. Just get the study done. You're wasting time. Well, we both know with lack of IV contrast, there are infinite things you can miss. We also know that if you only scan in a certain phase, that you are going to miss things as well. Some things like a hemangioma can be seen perhaps in arterial venous and delayed, though easiest to diagnose in venous. 
Some things like a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas may only be diagnosed in arterial phase and missed in venous in delayed phase. We also know that you can't do multiphase on everybody because of radiation dose. But again, you need to know who you should be doing dual phase on. You need to be part of the process. And again, we always talk about this, but you can't assume axial images will show everything. They won't. You need multiplanar routinely, and even if the axials are normal, you need to review the multiplanar. Things you can't see on the axials typically, or you miss commonly, anything with the spine, looking at the SMA celiac axis, there are many things you really can't visualize. And of course, we like 3D imaging, which particularly in defining certain tumors, extent of processes, inflammatory disease, trauma, you name it, may indeed be very, very valuable. Now, this article was published maybe a month ago, a very important article. It was published in JAMA Surgery, so it's not a radiology journal. And what they looked here was how important is IV contrast in the ER setting in the patient with abdominal pain? And what they did is they looked at the same patients on unenhanced CT by doing a contrast subtraction with dual energy, and then they looked at the contrast scans. They had multiple radiologists at different levels review the study, but here's the important conclusion. Unenhanced CT was approximately 30% less accurate than contrast enhanced CT for evaluating abdominal pain in the ER. Okay, 30%. That's, we're not arguing over 1% or 2%. 30% is massive. Yes, there is a potential risk of contrast, but the risk is small, and many articles recently have shown that it's a lot smaller than many people thought. And yes, a few people potentially can get reactions, but typically the reactions are going to be minor. Adding IV contrast provides the benefit of increased diagnostic accuracy at the cost of potential adverse events, but again, the risk of kidney injury varies based on preclinical and pre-CT kidney function. It approaches 0% with normal renal function. If you're careful, extravasation is low, and usually the patients have no consequences as long as you treat it correctly. Again, very, very important to use IV contrast. That's the quote. Tell it to the ER docs. Tell it to each other. Unenhanced CT is 30% less accurate. Would you want a study that was 30% less accurate? So that means it's not who's a better radiologist. We're talking the same radiologists are going to miss pathology 30% of the time without an IV contrast material. This consistent results were observed across three centers, multiple radiologists in each center, suggest that substantial diagnostic penalty is likely to be related to the removal of contrast rather than to radiologist idiosyncrasy. Bottom line is you need to use IV contrast. That's the protocol. We cannot spend enough time talking about CT protocols. This is not going to be a lecture about CT protocols, but I need to remind you, I do believe the biggest sources of error is the lack of use of oral and IV contrast material, the poor use of oral and IV contrast material, the poor timing, and the lack of getting sufficient sequences when doing the study. Those are some of the major sources of error. Again, you don't want to do something that's going to give you a 30% penalty. Okay, now let's look at some more specific things. If I ask the question, do you need to look at the full field of view on a CT scan or not? The answer has to be yes. And two different examples I'll give you, cardiac CT and spine CT. Yes, when we do cardiac CT, looking at the coronaries, we target on the heart because it gives you higher spatial resolution. So you can look in this case at the plaque and the LAD, and then you can create the 3D maps also, which show very nicely the plaque in the patient's right coronary artery. But again, we are targeting those images. But we also will always reconstruct full field of view images because full field of view images will give you the entire area you scanned. You already spent the radiation dose. Give the patient the advantage of seeing that lung cancer in the right lower lung. Remember in the beginning of cardiac CT, the cardiologist 
could not read chest CT, so they didn't want to have chest CTs. They said, okay, you shouldn't read outside the heart because that wasn't requested. We know that if it's on the skin, if it's radiated, we need to look at it. And again, you need to reconstruct full field of view. And on all of our reports, we say the full field of view was reviewed and we saw something or saw nothing. Very, very important. And again, this is true when you go to any CT scan. If you scan the patient, reconstruct everything. Yes, go ahead and target down for better resolution, but make sure you review the entire scan. This is true with imaging of the spine. I remember, and we've asked this question before, if you look at the people in neuro, for example, your institution, are you only doing the targeted views of the lumbar spine? Or are you doing also the full field of view? I will bet at your institution, you're probably only doing targeted lumbar spine images. And yes, that's the right thing to do, whether it's a myelogram or a regular CT scan, to get the best resolution. But extra spinal findings were present in 40% of adult outpatients undergoing lumbar spine CT exams for low back pain. And most of whom had findings classified in benign and not requiring further workup. However, the full field of view with the full abdomen was required to best optimize or only way to optimize and visualize extra spinal abnormalities in 79.4% of cases. Substantial extra spinal findings will be missed. And these include things like renal cell, TCC, CLL, sarcoid, abdominal aortic aneurysms, and this occurred 4.3% of their patients. So it's not a rare thing, it's common. Okay, another thing this brings up, what about the topogram or scout view, whatever you want to call it. In the days pre-PACS, we looked at the topogram always because you remember whether you had 16 on one film or four on one, the first image the text did was the topogram before you scanned the patient and had the lines on it. And the last image was the image with all of the lines. And we looked at that. It becomes very important, and I'll show you why. If you look at this case, this patient was said to have retained barium in the colon. If you looked at the topogram, it's part of a ring. The ring's attached to a sponge. A sponge was left behind. That's why the patient was febrile. In this case, again, it looks like barium. It's a lot of artifact. But if you looked at the topogram, this metal retractor was left behind. Uh, how, do you, how does that happen? Let's not go into that, but it happened. But on the topogram, it's obvious. In fact, you probably would look at the topogram and assume it was in front of or behind the patient, not in the patient, but then you realize the problem. Or in this case, where you notice that contrast was given to the patient, you see a little bit of it by the right axilla, but yet you don't see the aorta. Did it spill? Did the injector fail? Did, the, did it disengage? Well, when you look at the topogram, you see contrast from the antecubital fossa on the right, tracking down to the hand on the right and up to the shoulder. This patient had active extravasation. The topogram showed it, the radiologist didn't appreciate it and was trying to figure out why there was no contrast in place. You gotta look at the topogram. There's so much information that can be very helpful to you. Leonard Berlin wrote an article about this. In fact, he called me up once and he asked, do we look at the topograms on every case? And I kind of, well, not really. And there was a case in Chicago. And again, this is in AJR, so it's published already, the case where there was a sad story of a child who fell and a CT scan was done. And even in retrospect, there's no intracranial bleed. It was read as negative. A few hours later, the patient had a seizure and died. There was a skull fracture that was missed. On the routine axial images, even in retrospect, it's hard to see a skull fracture. It looks like a suture. But when you look at this sagittal topogram, even a layperson from across the room can see the fracture. When the radiologist was asked on the cross-examination why he didn't look at the topogram, the answer was, radio we don't look at topograms. Well, I think he does now. Because of... Um, the question about looking at topograms, we did a study. We had two people who were retired, Bill Scott, now they're retired. They were at the top of their game, always were to the day they stepped down. Bill Scott 
and Bob Gaylor looked at consecutive 2032 scout views and read them they were, like they were plain films. And the scout view showed a significant finding up to 23% of cases, usually in an atomic area, imaged by CT. And it was shown by CT, so it really didn't add anything. However, in up to 2% of cases, the abnormality disclosed in the scout view was not included in the CT field of view. And you understand the scalp view was often larger. You're getting abdominal CT, but on the scalp view, you weren't as good as you could be, so you have a lot of lung. So the scalp view had 2% of findings. That becomes very, very important. And in many of the cases, the finding was important. Berlin looked at this data and said, although 2% appears to be a low percentage, extrapolating to 85 million patients who undergo CT every year, means that 1.7 million patients may have an abnormal finding that is on the scalp view, but not seen on the related axial images. His conclusion was reasonable medical practice, logic, and medical legal, as well as ethical considerations, require you to review the topogram. Daphne wrote another article after that. Scout images are an integral part of any CT exam and should be carefully reviewed whether or not they're included in the field of view of the study. Itri made the point that perhaps we should make certain that the first image that comes up when someone reviews on PACS is the topogram, so they have to review it. Perhaps the report templates need to have a line uh, topogram. I saw nothing on the topogram or I saw something. Obviously, the challenge with topograms that comes up is people say, well, maybe you're going to overread. The mediastinum always looks wide and you're overcalling small bowel obstruction. Again, you've got to get used to looking at the topograms for what they are, but you want to look at them because they can contain important information. Now, let's go into another set of uh, images. And what I'd like to do is look at a few different topics Nothing as generic as looking at a scout view or a topogram, but looking at specific areas, and we'll start with bladder cancer and looking for potential sources of error. Let's do this. Let's take a break right now, and we'll come back with bladder cancer. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.